morning. Um, my name is Kerry Hallard and I'm the Chief Exec of the Global Sourcing Association and I'm absolutely delighted to be running the latest in our series of um, sourcing tech webinars. So these are a series of webinars that are looking at demystifying demystifying um, the uh, new and evolving technologies and bringing them into a, a simple um, jargon-free um, business context. So, um, so I'm joined today by a great old, two great old friends actually, um, Hayden Jones, who used, well, who's, who's been working with the GSA now for probably three or four years, and probably Alex Crevero, who's been with us even longer. So, um, Hayden is the Chief Exec of Blockchain Hub and also um, the Director for Blockchain at PwC and is the co-author of the book, The Executive Guide to Blockchain. So, um, so Hayden, um, welcome. Um, great reviews on the book. So um, the book's available on Amazon. I'll do the plugs for you, Hayden, but obviously yeah, you'll be able to plug to it be, yourself yeah. as well. Yeah. So um, recent reviews of the book say it's an indispensable read for anyone who understands the importance of skating to where the puck is going to be. And it's a compelling and jargon free. Um, this is for anyone who wants to stay on top of how digital currency is changing the world of business. So uh, Hayden, you're going to give us a, an overview, an introduction to blockchain and um, its applications. And then I'm going to hand over to Alex Rivero, who's the digital law lead at Herbert Smith Freehills, who's going to go into a lot more detail about smart contracting, I believe. So um, yeah, we really are focusing on making this a jargon free overview of blockchain. Please ask any questions. Uh, no question is, is too stupid, especially when it comes to blockchain, because I find it quite a, a complex technology myself. So um, I'll be fielding questions as we um, as we go through and certainly a full Q&A session at the end. So um, so with that, Hayden, it's over to you. Brilliant. There we go. So just checking everybody can see that. Yep. Thank you, Kerry. This is it's a real pleasure to be doing this because, um, as Kerry said, um, I've had a relationship now with the GSA probably it's almost four years actually. So when I first got into blockchain on a full time basis, uh, it was actually one of the first presentations I gave. And um, what was particularly enjoyable about it was the fact that um, somebody who is a former procurement professional so um, both in the context of running procurement at Deutsche Bank but also uh, working at uh, AT Kearney as uh, part of the uh, strategic sourcing team it's a real pleasure to be to be talking to uh, sourcing professionals so uh, it's good to be able to, to to give something bank something back especially in the context of blockchain so there we go um, there's the book on the left hand side there so it's available on Amazon um, just a little bit of background there. When I first got into uh, blockchain, I felt that the, the thing that was missing was um, a clear explanation because it was sort of somewhere between uh, blockchain is going to change the world and uh, very technical white papers that uh, were impenetrable from a mathematical perspective. Um, so myself and co-author Maria Grazia Vigliotti, uh, we're both very much in the same place in terms of the need for a text that uh, can be provided to professionals and help them understand uh, the way this technology can be applied in a business context. So um, it's very much out there. It, I'm, I'm, I'd encourage everybody to buy a copy, um, but depending upon how um, disposed I am, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, you send me your address and uh, you say nice things about the presentation, I'm very happy to send you a copy. Um, because um, I'm a big believer in actually pushing it out there and actually uh, getting it out there for people to understand. So, so what I'm going to do, um, as Perry said, um, I'm a director leading uh, blockchain activities within the UK. Um, I focus uh, cross sector, um, so range from financial services all the way through to consumer goods. And what I'm going to do is provide an overview of blockchain. Um, I'm going to talk about um, five pillars of blockchain, which I think is a very interesting concept uh, which is something that we've been developing and uh, importantly I'm going to talk about the intersect with uh, strategic sourcing and then bring out uh, smart contracts as a topic and then Alex will pick up then 
to, to expand on that further. Okay. So just as a, as a point of reference, we as PwC, uh, we have analyzed something like 250 plus technologies, and we focused on the eight that we believe are going to have the biggest impacts right now. Uh, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, drones, the Internet of Things, robotics, virtual reality, and 3D printing. I think what's, what's important about this slide, and the reason I always include it, is that um, we, um, we like to go to market with a combination of these technologies. So typically you would link up blockchain with the Internet of Things or, 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 or artificial intelligence. So you have blockchain which um, develops, so it will create a big data footprint. But what you would typically do is you would link a blockchain initiative certainly with data, and then you build that out into machine learning, and then obviously extend that into, into artificial intelligence. So, so for me, uh, blockchain has a very immediate play in terms of uh, reducing friction. But then what I want to stress is the sort of the intersect and the bridge then out into some of these other, inter some of these other, uh, other technologies which are equally important. Um, I'm going to read a very dry definition. Uh, of blockchain. Um, so I'm not going to make any apologies for this um, because um, I will explain how the bridge works from what is a fairly uh, sort of anodyne explanation of this as a technology. And then we can see how, what this means in practice. But, but blockchain is effectively a distributed transaction ledger with identical copies maintained on each of the network's computers. Transactions are grouped in blocks recorded one after another. Uh, referred to as the blockchain. The links between the blocks and the content are protected by cryptography. So uh, previous transactions cannot be destroyed or forged. Uh, the blockchain is immutable, so it can't be changed. And this means that the ledger, I don't know if somebody wants to go on mute there. Um, so this means that the ledger and the transaction network are trusted without a central authority. So that's a very dry definition. But what this means effectively is that we, we can bring together lots of people uh, that need to share information in a way that, be, that can be trusted. They can all update that information in a way that everybody can trust that those updates have been made correctly. And they can share that information and they can trust that information and it can't, it can't be hacked, most importantly. So that term immutable means that it's very difficult for um, malicious uh, forces to to gain access to the network and make changes to it. So it, it's a very powerful technology. And just to sort of play that forward another step, this is a very useful slide because what this does, it sort of creates a bridge between that, which is a fairly dry definition, and this which starts to bring it to life. Because um, the purpose of this slide is to show how, show what we can do with blockchain as a technology. And you can see there, there are four quadrants on that. We talk about a shared ledger. So everybody should be familiar with the concept of the general ledger. So that's Oracle, SAP, and Sage in terms of what they provide. ERPs are built, you know, their, their general ledger capability. Payments, so the transfer of value from uh, your commercial banks, so Barclays, HSBC, through the payments networks, bridging across then into the Bank of England and coming out the other side to have a payments network. Um, store of value which is what the Bank of England does. So uh, the money that sits in HSBC or Barclays is electronic money, but it's the preserve of the central bank to ensure that that, 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 that money, that electronic money, can have value ascribed to it in an economic context. And then the real exciting thing, which is what Alex is going to pick, on, pick up on, is the legal contract. Now, what's interesting is that we can bring all of those four things together. OK, so if there's one thing I want you to remember and think about uh, and uh, ponder over the weekend is the fact that uh, what distributed ledger technology allows you to do is to bring together ledgers, payments and store of value. And because of the fact that this is written in code, so it's written in computer code, we can attach conditions to it. Right. So. Uh, you know, think about what we currently have in normal organizations. The payments guys work on the second floor and there's 10 of them and they operate Swift and Bax and Chaps and the sort of payment requests go in, the invoices go in and the payments guys execute them. You've got the accounting guys who keep track of you know, Oracle, SAP, Sage, the general ledger. They sit on the fifth floor. They do their own thing. We've got the lawyers 
Um, you know, they've got lots of A4 lever arch files, lots of paper, lots of forms precedent. They're up on the, the seventh floor. They've got the lovely offices and the big mirrors and they got the best coffee in the building. Um, and then you've got the store of value. Now that's the preserve of the central banks. Um, so the Bank of England, they face off to the Barclays and they, they're the ones that look after. They're the ones that make sure that sterling has got value. Okay. Now what blockchain, and this was established by the B, that, that, the other B word, which is, stands for Bitcoin, what Bitcoin established was this ability to bring together ledger, payments, value, and legal contracts and actually bring it together in one place. Okay, so that means that it gives us the ability to actually remove the frictional cost associated with payments, ledgers, contracts, and store of value. Because if you think about this, the frictional cost of a payment in an economy does not in of itself add any value, okay? The frictional cost of operating a ledger does not in of itself add any value. Contracting cost does not add any value. And actually the technology gives us the ability to bring, I talked about three things there because actually linking into store of value is, is, is slightly harder because you are into the territory of the central banks. Um, so blockchain gives us the ability to bring those certainly those three things together, ledger, payments, and contracts. Um, and then when we start tying into, and I'll introduce this concept of central bank digital currencies in a moment, but once we link into central bank digital currencies, we can actually bring all those four things together. Uh, it's an incredibly important slide that. So if there's one thing to take away from this, it will be that. Now, um, what I want to do, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I want to get Alex on probably at about uh, maybe five to 11, but so that we can have 20 minutes for Alex and then we can do two minutes for Q&A. So I'm gonna run through these. So look, this is what a traditional supply chain looks like. Um, appreciate that you're all sourcing professionals. So I thought this might be a useful way um, that uh, we can present this. You've got inputs on the left-hand side there. So all the raw materials, we've got the whole supply chain, logistics, manufacturing, logistics, logistics, manufacturing, and there's some kind of point of sale or service delivery, point of service delivery on the right hand side there. Um, notice the orange arrow running left to right. So contract, contract, contract. So that's our traditional supply chain. And obviously those contracts are typically represented by physical bits of paper that are signed by two people or two entities that represents the legal relationship between those different tiers in the supply chain. Um, I talked about frictional cost and you can see here uh, you've got the banks at the top. So, you know, the Bank of England costs money to run. Uh, HSBC costs money to run. Barclays costs money to run. Um, they operate payments infrastructure. So obviously you've got payment um, flowing down from the point of consumption on the right hand side there, works its way through the supply chain, bridges across those, con those contractual obligations that sit between the tiers in the supply chain. And at the bottom there, You've got all of this data which is generated. You've got the relevant ERPs. And most importantly, you've got those little brick walls. Okay. The little brick walls are security perimeters. Okay. So they're the firewalls. So in a traditional context, in a traditional supply chain, it's very difficult to look back through the supply chain because um, you know, at the point of consumption, <clears throat> you're just going to see as far as point of sale. Okay. But sitting behind point of sale. Is a whole supply chain that actually goes back to, if you like it, the barrel of oil um, that was uh, refined at the f refinery that was then turned into uh, the plastic that was then used to create uh, the biro. So, so the purpose of this slide is to talk about is, is to highlight the frictional cost that sits within existing supply chains. Now, I talked about a shared ledger, and I talked about a shared distributed ledger. Um, what a distributed ledger can do is it allows all of those parties in the supply chain to write to that ledger in a way that the information can be trusted. OK, and you can see there there's a term that we've used cryptography, um, which um, is, uh, is about how we encrypt and secure information so it can be trusted. Um, and what a distributed ledger allows us to do, as I said, is for lots of parties who don't know each other, who don't necessarily trust each other, to come together in a way and they can write information to 
a shared record that we can all trust. And then that gives us this ability up on the right hand side there. Um, the, at the point of consumption, it actually gives us the ability to look back through the supply chain and look at all the different updates that have been made. And some of the interesting work that we have been exploring in areas such as uh, coca beans, as PwC, and also things like tobacco, interestingly, um, and things like sustainability um, and uh, the payment of duty and um, you know, the use of things like child labor as well. And what you can do is you can ask different tiers in the supply chain to attest to the fact that different terms and conditions have been adhered to and they can prove it evidentially. So at the point of consumption, a consumer can be comfortable that a particular product has been manufactured in a way that is compliant with whatever sustainability or CSR or ESG um, uh, biases that they may have. But equally, as you work through the supply chain, the point of sale or that manufacturing step can be comfortable that the tiers precedent, so what's happened before, they are compliant with whether it's child labor or whether it's sanctions or whether it's sustainability requirements. So it is very clever technology and it all stems from this idea that we can bring together, we have a ledger that we can share. People can uh, put legal, can create a framework of legal contracts between the different tiers in the supply chain. And we can use those legal contracts to exchange value um, at the point of delivery goods or at the point of delivery for goods and services. Okay. Very good. So playing this forward, I think somebody should come off mute there just in case there's a question. Um, so um, playing this forward, you can see there's a final step there. And what we've done is that is if we if we if we can share if we can share information, uh, it also means that we can actually extend that further up a level and we can share things like contracts. We can publish contracts and we can publish these obligations that exist between these different tiers in the supply chain so that they're legally binding, so that when goods or services are delivered, there is the automatic release of a payment provided that the, the goods adhere to uh, some relevant specifications. So this allows us to automate the, um, uh, those tiers in the supply chain so we can automatically release value at the point of delivery of goods or services. So again, very clever technology. Um, and um, if we play this up further, and again, I think one of my, you know, since I first started um, presenting at the GSA way back, um, so four years ago, um, we were all talking about blockchain. Um, and one of the problems I've always had with the term is that it's a bit like me turning up and talking about, um, you know, some deep physics associated with radio, okay, because it's very abstract, okay. So what we've been trying to do as PwC as a company is, is to move the narrative up and talk about five really interesting things that we can do with blockchain. So CBDC, central bank digital currencies, what the central banks can do, they can borrow the ideas within digital currencies and they can use those ideas to create electronic money, okay, digital money that we can then use to build <coughs> programmable money on top that allows us to sort of even further reduce the friction in the supply chain. So pillar one is we can use blockchain for things like value payments, money, central bank digital currency. Pillar two, provenance, so where does stuff come from? Because if we can all write to a ledger here, um, we can also track where stuff has come from. So I can, I can uh, take um, something like a pharmaceutical product. I can ensure the provenance and the authenticity of that pharmaceutical product because I can see the updates that have been made to the, uh, made to the blockchain. Uh, we can use it for things like credentials and certificates. So um, we can use, we, we as PwC have got a platform called Smart Creds, which is used for capturing certificates and identity associated with academic achievement, uh, professional uh, qualifications in a you know, business context. So in the same way, we're writing to a shared ledger. We can borrow the ideas from that and we can use it for certification and identity. Um, the most relevant to this audience is agreements. So I can use smart contracts and blockchain for automating procure to pay. Um, so I can create a catalog of smart contracts that I can almost put in a, uh, an Amazon-like environment and I can allow people to call them down and deploy them at different tiers in the supply chain. So I can use 
pillar four agreements, I can create electronic agreements that take out friction at different tiers in the supply chain. And then pillar five is very interesting because I can borrow the ideas from value um, and I can use it for things like loyalty, reward, uh, data, anonymization. So we have a platform called blockchain vouchers. Um, so if you think about things like Nectar points or BA points um, or your Marks and Spencer's point scheme, what we can do is we can bring those schemes together and we can create fungibility across schemes. So instead of just having you know, 15 bits of plastic in my wallet, I can just have a single app that brings all of those schemes together. So, so we've been pushing to, to raise the narrative up. So we're not talking about blockchain, we're talking about interesting things you can do with this technology. So value, provenance, identity, agreements, engagement. Um, so I'm gonna draw to a close in about two minutes now. Um, this is what I refer to as an economy on a page. Um, and you can see there on the left-hand side, all supply chains start with energy, raw materials, and IP. And then as we work through the supply chain, they're turned into things that we can make use of. So, um, you know, a bit large chemicals, you know, raw materials such as iron, steel, you know, gases, they go through some kind of manufacturing process. Eventually they get turned into things that we recognize. So whether it's a watch, a bio, or some coffee even. And then what then happens is that we start seeing the evolution of these more sophisticated services, such as financial services, you know, real estate, healthcare, pharmaceutical. And then on the far side there on the right, you've got even more sophisticated, sophisticated services, which are things like government, public sector, which take everything on the left-hand side and they package it up so that we as people can live in a society. And they've got access to things like education, <clears throat> the judiciary, um, you know, governmental support. So, so this is important. And you can see the grey arrows. They talk about where we can use the, you know, this technology around blockchain to, to reduce friction. We can use it where does stuff come from? How do we engage the consumer? How can we move value back through the supply chain? How we can automate physical agreements? Okay, really important slide because it kind of puts us as sourcing professionals. We're you know, sourcing professionals very much on the right hand side, given you know where many of you um, you know are, are, are currently working as organisations. But uh, so you should be thinking about what happens in the tier before you, what happens in the tier uh, on the other side to so upstream of you. Um, blockchain flows through every part of the business. So I think I've highlighted this supply chain. We can use it for improving effectiveness of finance, loyalty, legal entities, digital currencies, records management, audit and compliance. I've made this point quite strongly. Um, you know, a, a single database is not a use case for blockchain. We need to have lots of people who are sharing data that need to update that data and need to verify that the data is correct. Uh, there are lots of intermediaries that we want to remove uh, we need up-to-date data and the transactions are linked in some way. So I think one of the questions in the invitation was where to use blockchain. That is your kind of prerequisite. So if you've got a single point of like a database, you shouldn't be using blockchain for just a simple database application. Lots of people coming together, needing to share information in a way that they can be trusted. So um, I'm going to hand over to Alex in about one minute now. Um, as sourcing professionals, what should you be thinking about? Um, surveys, uh, you know, given everything we've gone through over the last six months, what are, what are the sort of issues they're facing? Prioritise those surveys in terms of, uh, you know, how can we solve these problems? Um, I'm very keen, as somebody that's been very close to procure to pay in particular and strategic sourcing, I'm very keen to go through a process, a proof of concept with an organisation to look at how we can deploy smart contracts across segments of the supplier community to automate uh, the delivery of you know, goods and services. So we release payment automatically. So very keen to have you know, any further conversations off the back of that. Um, so you know, that would start with some kind of you know, opportunity assessment in the context of smart contract driven procure to pay. Um, and then building on that, you know, because you're gathering data, what you can then do is use that data footprint to, uh, to profile uh, supply chain risk. So that's pretty much it. I think, um, as I said, um, you know, the book is on Amazon. It'd be great if you could buy it and uh, it'd be great if you could leave a, a review. But that said, depending on how um, exposed I am, you know, if, you, if you look me up on LinkedIn uh, and uh, send me a message on LinkedIn, including your address, very happy to send you a copy. So thank you very much indeed.
I'm going to stop sharing now and then we can hand back to our chair. OK, thanks ever so much, Hayden. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions for you, Hayden, before we hand over to Alex. So um, two questions really looking at if you could bring this to life with um, some real life examples of who is actually using um, blockchain and what savings they might be getting in both time and costs. Yeah, so I think I think the um, most most interesting one is probably IBM uh, with Walmart and uh, some of the challenges that they've had with um, with um, foodstuffs in the United States because they are con contaminated with E. coli. And the problem with that, and the particular use case was lettuce, actually. And the problem they had there was um, that uh, obviously people were getting ill, right? And it was causing uh, lawsuits for Walmart. And um, Walmart basically said to the supply chain, listen, you know, we, if you want to supply us lettuce, You've got to write your information, you've got to write the provenance of that product onto our blockchain so that we can see that you've gone through all of the requisite hygiene, farming, transportation steps. So it's, it's a product that we can trust. So that is more about risk management than it is necessarily about taking cost out. Um, but obviously there is a, there's a cost associated with risk. Um, I think the, the second one is, and it might be, it might be a step away from what, what we're exposed to as a community, but certainly with trade finance is a very use case. And again, what we do um, is sh goods are shipped um, as they work their way through the supply chain. People want to get paid, but there's lots of different intermediaries who are involved in there who need to sign off on those different shipments. And again, that's about... Um, moving money down the supply chain because we can confirm they're actually you know, the, good, the goods exist so so there are um a, again i mean it's ibm that principally uh, led some of that work with Maersk. um so there are definitely use cases there in terms of what we can do but i think i think i'm you know procurement is has yet really to to kind of pick up the the torch and actually move this forward um and having you know I mean, was it best part of best part of 16, 17 years ago? Uh, we led a big piece of work at Deutsche Bank to to outsource procure to pay to to Accenture. Um, I am really interested in in kind of taking these ideas and applying them in a procure to pay context because I've not really seen I've seen you know a few ideas around smart contracts in a procurement context, but I've I've not seen an organisation really pick up the torch and say we're going to do this for our for our supply community. Okay, thank you. Right, one other question before we hand over, and that is, um, has there been any significant progress in reducing energy consumption involved in use of DLT? I love this question. This is my favorite question. This is my favorite question. Well, well done, uh, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> I said, well done, Sarah. Yeah. She asked Look, I mean, the, way, the way I think about this is, if we, we go back to Robert Louis Stevenson, okay, and we go back to old steam engines, right? And they're all driven by coal and uh, big and smoky and expensive and uh, it generated lots of heat and they were highly inefficient, okay? But they did the business. They moved things from A to B, okay? And we fast forward, you know, 150 odd years. And we had the puffing billy, I believe as well, that was, uh, that used to explode, um, but it did the same thing. So coal, steam, water, propulsion. Um, the way to think about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is basically a big steam engine. Okay, it uses lots of energy, and it uses lots of energy because it's it's exposed to the threat of um, you know, being hacked by seven billion people every day because it's an open source protocol. Okay, but you know, Bitcoin's ten years old. Thinking's advanced quite considerably. We're now in a place where we can retrofit new types of cryptography that make um, the ideas around Bitcoin distributed ledger. So much more energy efficient. So, um, and, and the interesting thing is, forgive me, the interesting thing as well is if we start putting firewalls around uh, dig distributed ledger technology, the, 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 the level of cryptography we, we need to secure it starts to reduce as well. So there are, there are ways um, VMware, for example, um, has a very good blockchain offering. Um, you know, we all recognize what VMware does and is and how it operates. So yeah, for me, if VMware are in there offering this as a protocol, you know, we, we, we've been doing a piece of work with VMware recently, and there's no mention of 
you know, energy overhead because we're at a place now. Everybody has this idea of Bitcoin that uses you know, lots of energy and it's you know, miners and you know, based in Ireland and Canada. But we've moved way beyond that now. And um, you know, we're in a place that we can start to take you know, some of the capabilities that people like VMware have got and use them in a real enterprise context. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much for that, Hayden. I think at this point we, we do need to move over to Alex. So, Alex Cravero, um, uh, HSF, over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm just going to try and get this up and running. There we go. Hopefully, that shows. Um, so, look. Thank you very much for having me on to talk about this. That's, that's fantastic from Hayden, a really brilliant introduction to both smart, uh, to both blockchain and smart contracts. It's an area that's particularly close to my heart uh, and that of Herbert Smith Freehill. Um, I lead the uh, digital law group at Herbert Smith Freehills in the UK, US and EMEA. Um, it's a team of specialist lawyers from various different uh, jurisdictions, 13 offices currently, um, that all look uh, work as a multidisciplinary team, but look at uh, advising our clients on the challenges presented by digital transformation. And one of those core areas, of course, is, is blockchain and smart legal contracts or smart contracts that are coming into play as well. That also includes from our side the development of the infrastructure, that blockchain infrastructure that Hayden was talking about, for those smart contracts or smart legal contracts to run on as well. They need something that's particularly uh, secure. Hayden mentioned about the firewalls that must sit around blockchain, the, the way that you can move from public to private types of ledger. Um, and that's something that we're doing in collaboration with indeed IBM and CSIRO Data 61 out in Australia, specifically to run these types of new digital contract. But I'll talk a bit more about those in a second. First, I think I'm just going to quickly touch on a few of the uh, issues, potentially legal issues, regulatory issues and ethical issues that sit around blockchain itself. Um, dampening the mood, of course, as, as our, us lawyers typically do. Um, there's a few different things that have to be borne in mind when you're thinking about blockchain, really from a legal and regulatory side. Intellectual property around data sets is always one service level agreements with vendors is potentially another one or indeed with, uh, with various uh, other parties in the chain. The big one that always comes up um, is, is around data privacy, of course. Um, one of the key USPs for blockchain technology is the fact that the ledger is immutable. It's effectively unable to be changed, tampered with or otherwise. And when you think about that in the context of the general data protection regulations, the DPA 2018, uh, and specifically data subjects rights to erasure, to rectification, to data portability, for example, you can see that there's perhaps some friction between the two approaches. There are some solutions to these things. For example, you can store data off chain. There's things that salted hashes and all of this kind of stuff that's coming out. There's an argument that you can delete the private key for the blockchain um, ledger itself for, for the specific individual if there is one. Um, and that would prevent them from being able to access the data. It's effectively equivalent to erasure without being erasure. But in reality, we're in a place where you just have to assess those things on a case by case basis. Another one of those USPs, I think that, that Hayden rightly mentioned as well, and the thing that really makes it fantastic is the ability to join up these, these um, processes end to end across any jurisdiction. Nodes can effectively be anywhere in the world, but that gives rise to some quite complex jurisdictional problems sometimes. Transactions, well, as a result of nodes being anywhere in the world, transactions can occur under the jurisdiction of each of the different nodes. Blockchain therefore has to comply, or the blockchain therefore has to comply with numerous different legal and regulatory regimes um, as a result of that. And because principles of contract and title differ across different jurisdictions, that can start to cause a bit of mayhem. Um, it, it becomes extremely unworkable. Really, that just means uh, looking at who the blockchain vendors are, looking at what the ecosystem looks like and identifying the contractual uh, relationships between the parties from the outset, particularly the relationship between the vendor and indeed the user, if, if indeed that's the relationship in question. Identify the governing law in those contractual documents, such as the terms of use, identify that jurisdiction and make sure that that's clearly set out up front as well. 
Liability, of course, I think is one of those other ones that springs to mind in this sense. And we're going to touch on this when I talk about smart legal contracts in a second as well. But generally with blockchain, um, there's always that risk of systemic issues occurring with the infrastructure. I mean, it's potentially significant when you think about the, the uh, actions that are actually being carried out on the chain. A good example of this is, in fact, smart contracts. If you have a payment function, the payment function uh, is is incorrectly working, therefore multiple payments are coming out under one of these smart contracts. What, as a result of the infrastructure, I should say, or it doesn't occur is an alternative. What is the legal right to recourse as a result of that? What are you as, a, as an individual going to be able to do? And again, this comes back to those contractual documents as it, as it always does, but allocating and apportioning risk liability in those contractual documents between the user and the vendor, so yourselves and the vendors, and potentially, depending on the relationship of the parties, the other participants in that blockchain as well. Um, so it requires some serious thought from the outset. Exit. Um, I'm just going to touch on one more and then I'm going to canter on through the rest of it, appreciating time. But exit, vendor lock-in um, is, is one of those things that comes springs to mind in these kind of situations as well. These, these ecosystems can be very large, very complex. There can only be, you know, sometimes one supplier in the chain, trade lens or whoever it might be in these things. What if the user at the end of, you know, the relationship they have and they want to port over someone else doesn't have a copy of their own data or their own copy of the data, I should say. Um, can it be easily handed over? Does the platform interoperate with other platforms to enable or facilitate an easy transfer between them? Um, there are all questions, again, that need to be asked in, in the context of blockchain. And really, again, it drives that need to do your due diligence up front and ensure you know what you're actually buying into before you do it. I thought the ethical question, just to touch on this, because there is really that one big ethical question, was, was a fantastic one. And it's one that we hear time and time again. Um, Hayden, Hayden covered this wonderfully a second ago. Uh, ago. I, I think it's really that distinction between uh, public and private. We've, been, we've, we've become so accustomed to thinking of blockchain in the context of public ledgers like Bitcoin, where you have to have these complex proof of work mechanisms and consensus algorithms to mitigate the risk of fraud. Um, as we move into this new world that, that Hayden was talking about, where we have these private blockchains, and indeed, that's where smart legal contracts will need to run or on the private blockchains. You um, sort of alleviate those problems. You know who the other parties are. You're not trying to get a non, uh, you know, anonymization on the platform. That's not the benefit. In fact, knowing the other parties is one of those things that you can do. And once you trade off that, um, that piece, the risk of fraud goes down. There's certainly less need for to be running these complex consensus algorithms or mechanisms and these complex proof of work. And with that, um, ero erosion, the um, the issue of environmental um, impact sort of dis uh, dissipates as well. So that was a canter through uh, some of those things. Smart contracts, smart legal contracts. I'm, I'm again just going to canter everything. I feel Hayden did a fantastic job at introducing this as a topic, um, and I'm going to get on to some of the legal issues that we see with them. But um, to start with, I'm just going to quickly draw a distinction because you'll see that I'm referring to this as smart legal contracts and have done so far, rather than smart contracts. And there, there is a specific reason for that, um, albeit slightly academic in nature. The Hayden alluded to it a bit earlier, smart contracts in their very simplistic terms are actually pieces of computer protocol or a piece of computer code that executes a command. That might reflect or execute the terms of a legally binding contract, but it also might not. Ultimately, actually, and there is a bit of a confusion in the market at the moment, particularly between technologists and lawyers, smart contracts don't necessarily need to be either smart nor a contract to meet the definition of smart contract. And that can give rise to a whole host of issues when you're thinking about um, sourcing in a legally binding fashion in a way that actually is, is appropriate for what you're trying to achieve. So that end, I'm referring to smart legal contracts then as effectively a legally binding smart contract. And to that, I mean a traditional legally binding contract that incorporates computer code into it. So when it's connected to data sources such as APIs or IoT sensors and run on a blockchain platform, it automates the performance of certain contractual obligations that are housed within that legally binding contract itself. Why is all of this important, certainly the way that I see it, is because legal contracts underpin, as, as Hayden rightly pointed out in that, in that wonderful diagram, and they underpin a majority of our business relationships, a vast majority of them, in fact. 
And in analog form, our legal contracts are fundamentally detached from reality. Um, they effectively, having been negotiated so hard and so heavily between the parties, sit on a shelf gathering dust until there's a point of dispute between the parties or until there's a point that needs to be checked and, and discussed and argued between you. And that drives them into a place where they're extremely inefficient. Um, and it's building that efficiency in this chain, which is so important. There's a stat out at the moment that I've seen that says about there's about 9% average contract leakage annually from poor contract management. And that's something that when you think about across your entire contractual estate, uh, when sourcing, uh, and it's certainly even in some of the uh, individual contracts in your sourcing relationship, that can be an enormous amount of money each year. So we're talking about then incorporating the computer code directly into the contract itself to make it more efficient. And why is that important? Why do we need to incorporate the code directly into the contract? Why can't it sit alongside it? The complexity of contracts, frankly. Um, complex processes under the contract touch on many different parts of the contract itself. Um, a lot of the benefit comes from stringing, as Hayden rightly mentioned, different pieces of the contract together to get automation between different elements of the of the contract itself. And I'm going to touch on a couple of use cases in a second very quickly. But if you're going to be dealing with something as complex as a contract and automating certain of those provisions, complex webs of provisions underneath it, effectively you need to have your technologists and lawyers up front determining that the contractual drafting is appropriate to be converted into computer code in some capacity and that the computer code is in fact reflective of what you wanted to achieve in the, in the con uh, contractual drafting. And that really requires bringing the two together up front. This comes back to that thing that you know, I and other lawyers always harp on about, about getting everyone in the room from the outset really is vital if you're going to be using codified contracts to drive efficiencies in your supply chain. And to ensure the code continues to work um, in the contract as it's amended through its life cycle, we need to have this, uh, this process of setting the code out in the contract itself as well. Um, and that means, uh, again, getting those parties together in the room, that means combining legal contracts and code um, and I'll talk a bit about the legals and the standards that are coming in to kind of address these complexities. Um, but certainly, as you think about, uh, you know, going through a life cycle with uh, a legal contract where you amend it, I've certainly seen them reach a couple of thousand amendments before uh, in my life, which which is not fantastic. But if your computer code is supposed to be pegging against uh, those contractual obligations and they are changing fundamentally, really having the code and the uh, contractual terminology separate is just going to cause all number of headaches further on. So we're talking really about combining those things together in that respect. And the benefits of those, look, Hayden's already talked to, to these points fantastically a second ago anyway. It enables you to connect your contract uh, with and interact with information in the data rich world. So this is the API, the IT sensors and everything else. It really brings your business relationships to life dusts off those analog contracts, those dumb contracts, as I like to call them, um, and gives them arms and legs and allows them to actually connect into the real world and become something that's useful to you. It does that through automating those routine processes that are described in the contract. So, hey, can lose this payment when triggers are met. Automatic purchase price adjustment for the under the contract for quality of goods and services based on the input from connected sensors. Automatic annual price adjustments linked to trusted public indexes, for example. We see that all the time that a, a price adjustment is incorporated into a contract and then it's sort of forgotten about until that yearly cycle comes around, hopefully before the yearly cycle comes around. But the invoices then don't end up balancing necessarily with the with the um, annual price hikes that are supposed to be there as well. You need complex systems to run it when actually your contract has all that information anyway. It is some of the reasons it's on a blockchain as well um, and I'll, I'll just touch on that in a second but it provides you with a single shared version of the truth and I mentioned this a second ago about working off different versions or about amendments potentially but from conversations with our clients we know that there's probably about 10 percent of their contractual estate where they know for a fact they're probably working off a different version to their, their supplier or vendor or whoever it is that they might have their customer or whoever um, and that just opens the door to contractual risk and liability problems um, that's that's a potentially serious issue. This removes that by providing you with a platform that can store a single version of truth. You know it's on an immutable ledger, which is very beneficial. Nobody can tamper with it. And you've therefore got that ability to say, this is the version we're working off. It's version 125 or whatever it might be. It also enables some new, really exciting things to happen with your contracts as well um, and your contractual estate. It generates and captures data throughout the life cycle of a contract. Uh, um, so if you're getting all of this data input into your contract and onto the blockchain via these various different data sources you've connected to, 
And you've got this secure immutable audit trail um, being generated as a result of the blockchain technology that you're using. You're able to get some really interesting insight into the real time events that are being um, or performance events that are taking place in relation to your contracts. And that enables you to then run analytics over the top of them, uh, either on that contract individually or across your wider contractual estate. Um, and that is going to give you new, very interesting insights into your business, driving new business models, optimizing existing business models, potentially saving revenue or so on and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunity that stems from being able to do, um, do all of this, to try and merge these, these uh, legal contracts and computer code in that way. Why blockchain? Already talked about it very quickly, and I'm not going to harp on, uh, harp on too much about it, but security, sort of first and foremost. A lot of you might be thinking, can you not just do this through a centralized platform? And the answer is, in theory, yes. Um, a lot of this could be done through centralized platforms, but can you entrust a third party to hold all of your contracts? Can you entrust them to hold this third, this contractual data, uh, particularly if there's a complex web of different parties involved in these transactions, um, especially when they're connected to the real world? Imagine that you've got a centralized platform and there's downtime on, on that platform, but your contract is supposed to be auto performing elements of it by connecting into data sources in real time. Well, during that downtime, what happens? Effectively, your contract doesn't perform those obligations automatically. Yes, you can fall back on the contractual terms that underpin them, sure. But what if that downtime is, is unknown to you beforehand? It's emergency downtime. You're left in a position where you're effectively potentially breaching your terms of your contract without uh, really having had any understanding of the fact that was going to be turning up. The other side of it as well is, um, uh, and it's not really, it's, you know, it's, it's something that all of us think perhaps would not happen, but it's unilateral amendment. It's effectively fraud in relation to the contract. Can you entrust your contract with a third party? Do you know that one of their employees isn't going to go and just change one of the terms in the contract for you? For whatever reason, because they're annoyed, we've seen it with um, various different um, you know, data protection related issues that are coming out at the moment. But perhaps they just change a term of the contract and lo and behold, you now have a single version of the truth that has a, a changed term in it and you don't really have any way of, of reconciling that. The immutable nature of a blockchain ledger, the fact you can't delete things, the fact you can't change things, you have to add a new element of, uh, to the chain, new block to the chain, gets around that effectively. It eliminates that potential risk um, and so that's why we say that typically we would want to see these things on a blockchain based platform. Use cases, I think Hay Hayden's touched on already, um, fantastic. Um, finance is a great one. Uh, looking at that end to end supply chain, just one thing I'm going to bring out on that side of things and the, the automated payments and the way that you can do these things. Trade finance is, is a great example of this. Um, HSBC and Bay wrote a paper a, a while ago now um, that explored the potential benefits that the blockchain and smart contracts could bring to a trade finance. Um, uh, transaction effectively to, to ship goods from location A to location B. And where you had paper-based trade finance transactions taking 10, five to 10 days on average to get through the process, it took a blockchain-based smart contract process uh, less than 24 hours to clear all of the same process, uh, uh, elements of the process or chain through. That is a huge potential amount of, of cost saving of, of, of additional revenue generation you can do. It just is a significant step forward in your sourcing journey. There's a couple of things on here as well, um, probably worth just very quickly touching on before I jump onto some of those very high level legal issues. Um, automated contract notifications, think about things like your service level regimes uh, throughout your end to end contract life cycle. Um, you know, if there's a service level regime that provides service credits for defined thresholds not being met, you could connect the contractual service level regime into a data source such as the service level monitoring software that you use, or dare I say it, even uh, a single software that both supplier and customer use for monitoring, for example. Um, if the software detects the service level failure, it can feed that back to a clause which then automatically sends the notice to the supplier requesting the relevant service credit. If you think about this in the context of what Hayden was talking about in terms of financial transactions, payments, and even invoicing, you could take that one step further and connect that contractual provision, that service level regime, and that data source through to your invoicing procedures or payment procedures as well. So that actually, instead of having to notify the supplier to then get that service credit applied manually to an invoice that's sent through to you, you can just have the contract then also generate the invoice accounting for the service credit that's detected as due under the separate provisions. This is all very complicated sounding, and it is because these kind of contracts are very complicated, but hopefully it's driving across 
some of the potential benefits that you could be achieving through this type of software um, and, or com combination, I should say, of computer code and, um, and uh, legal clauses. With all that said, and just very conscious of time, so I'm only going to touch on a couple of points here. We, if we're going into a world where we've got computer code and legal contracts being fused together inextricably, we need to think about the legal and indeed regulatory and other issues that might arise from this. And this is actually what's driving the creation of a lot of standards for smart contracts at the moment. We've seen BSI 333, we've seen ISO TC 307, WG3 specifically under there is looking at smart contracts. So we're now starting to see a world where uh, legal contracts are potentially going to be subject in some respects to technical standards as well, um, which is a fascinating but highly complicated area potentially. It, it, keeping on the theme of blockchain, because uh, you know I think there's some really interesting nuances that we have to think about when we're looking at smart contracts that run on blockchain. I'm going to touch on just two or three of these. Blockchain platform conditions, effectively, your choice of platform is going to influence how your contract runs. And because and that's because the functionality of the blockchain platform is probably going to limit um, what you can do with your smart legal contract itself. For example, you've got some blockchain platforms, particularly at the public end of the spectrum, that are designed only to allow self, like fully self-executing contracts that can't be kept confidential. They can't be stopped. That's the pure breed view of what a smart contract is. Um, and they can't be amended. When you think about your business relationships and the way that you manage your contracts and you manage your business relationships, that fundamentally just isn't going to work. Um, and so really what that drives you to in terms of the solution on this, it comes back to the same thing again and again, do your due diligence up front on the platform, design your smart legal contract to comply with the technical specifications of the platform and indeed those standards I mentioned earlier, and very much ensure those terms of use for the platform that you're going to be contracting into, set out the processes for the parties to grant permissions and set rules regarding how the contracting parties interact with the code, how the platform interacts with you if things go wrong, how third parties such as arbitrators or court enforcers or regulators, if you are regulated, can get access to agreed clauses if that is something you're doing, you're opening up that visibility to them. So dispute resolution, for example, is a good one there. Um, and there's probably some boilerplate drafting you can be doing in your smart legal contracts as well to address those things. I'm going to touch on operational issues actually in the application of digital risk as well, just because we touched on it earlier. We're now talking about having real-time connections in smart legal contracts uh, and given that parties are going to have to assess how um, or whether a clause is performing as intended there is that added element of risk that actually you've contracted to do something you've got a, a, a codified provision carrying it out is the clause actually performing as you had expected it to and to that end which party is going to assume the risk of ensuring accuracy in time in your data flows which what happens when faulty data sources cause contractual obligations to be missed or, or are incorrectly performed by parties. This is back to that example I gave earlier of what happens if multiple payments are made where actually only one should have been, for example. Um, and who has the right to use the data and records under the contract and how? That comes back to that point about intellectual property and data that I mentioned earlier. And frankly, the way to address these things is through the drafting of the smart legal contracts themselves. And that is something that we at Herbert Smith Freehills, that my team particularly is focused very hard on at the moment, is identifying each of these issues and drafting appropriate boilerplate or otherwise contractual terminology that addresses and allocates the uh, risk of, of, um, of these issues arising and the liability associated with them to the various different parties. It's just a process that you have to go through now to uh, enjoy the benefit that can come from these uh, you know, digitized con contracts, shall we call them. Huge canter through um, for everybody there. Um, I hope that that um, has been useful. Um, if there's any questions, I would be more than happy to um, to take them. Yeah, that was a fabulous canter through. Yeah, Thank you so much, Alex. Um, um, yeah, there are some uh, questions. Yeah, uh, have I got a terrible echo here? Is that okay? Um, yeah, so again, it's looking for real life examples. And I think there's two questions really. And that's looking at how many blockchain contracts have you brokered? And how many smart contracts have you um, actually done? So it's a really interesting area. It's a really fantastic question. It depends on which end of the smart contract spectrum you're looking at, right? And so what we're talking about is a bit of a 
it's a long journey. We talk about something called an internal and external model in all of this. Um, and, and at one end of that, you have the, the purest view that is all, all uh, legal contracts can become computer code. And at the other end, you've got this external model where effectively um, the uh, computer code sits in a separate document, pairs with the legal contracts. Those very simple external model based smart contracts, we're seeing quite a lot in the financial services industry in particular um, for very simple transactions. And so you're thinking about the automation of payment obligations um, in the most simple kind of fashion um, in, a, in a sort of tr trade trade aspect or trade deal. In terms of, of moving down towards what I'm talking about in this more of a middle ground, um, these smart legal contracts that truly incorporate the code into the contract itself. This is very much a technology that's in process of being built at the moment. So again, we're, we're building the infrastructure that underpins this in Australia, for example, and that is still in process. There are other companies that are building that infrastructure still in the UK, um, and they're starting to come into, into shape at the moment. We're speaking with a number of different clients, it has to be said, about developing these contracts, and we're actively developing at least for a couple um, out in Australia at the moment, um, in the financial services space, in the energy infrastructure spaces, um, and a few others as well, particularly looking at the supply chain uh, and complex sourcing areas. Um, it's uh, it, What I would say is it's an early stage of the journey on this one, but it's a journey that needs to be considered now because the first step of this journey, actually, if you want to digitize your contracts, from my perspective at least, is you need to figure out where all of your contracts are in your contractual estate. And actually, a lot of a lot of companies or a lot of clients we talk to don't really have that centralized management system in place. They don't have their hands around all of these different contracts that they can do. There's then a whole process that you would want to consider of, particularly if you you're going to be um, automating contractual provisions or co codifying contractual provisions across um, a number of different similar types of agreements. So if you're talking about invoicing procedures and you want to do that across hundreds of your contracts, you then want to start looking at standardizing parts of your contracts themselves as well. So standardizing the way that you write those contractual provisions so that you can back off the computer code with it. These are all things that take time. Um, and so these are all parts of the journey. So um, it's kind of a long way around of saying, very basic stuff. We're already starting to see the more complex stuff. This is what we're actively working on. This is where I think we can really see that saving on the 9% and that's still in progress, but you need to start thinking about them now. Okay, so next question, and then we'll come on to the tax question. And that is the, the service credit use case you um, shared. Is that a, a real example or just a potential? The service credit credit use case that we shared, we have got, uh, so we're, we are developing, as we are internally at the moment, um, you know, this kind of functionality as test functionality, it is something that is capable of, of being done. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's not, a, we've not implemented it into a third party contract yet for the same reasons I just mentioned a second ago, but it is, is, is it technically possible? Yes, it's technically possible. Okay, great. All right. Um, Hayden, do you want to pick up the conversation about tax? And you're on mute. Eminently, carry, but yes, um, I think I made the point in the in the chat actually. So, I mean, HMRC have been very clear locally with respect to uh, the tax position. Okay, in terms of capital gains tax, um, corporation tax, and VAT. So, so it's treated like fit. Um, and I think you've just got to be careful if there are interjurisdictional um, uh, linkages that you've created that you then reference back to the local the local tax authority. But I think. I think Alex, uh, you know, very much in the same place on this, that the, there is enough thinking and, you know, we as PwC, we've got a tax capability. So we certainly have enough uh, capability to kind of navigate the, the tax issues. I think that the higher order is to get it working from an operational and a, and a tech perspective. Okay, thank you. Right, so we're kind of out of time. So I just want to leave with one question for one same question for you both. And that is, what's your predictions for how fast this is going to um, progress? And has lockdown escalated or slowed down development of blockchain? Shall I? I'll go first. Um, I think the, so if you go back to my five pillars, the five pillars, the thing that will drive value is central bank digital currencies. And that will be um, that will sit alongside regulation, okay? Um, and that will underpin the sort of uh, creation of this digital economy. And that will flow through then into things like loyalty and also agreements. If we look at provenance and we look at identity and credentials, that's already there. That technology can be done. Um, and we're already—I mean, I'm seeing 
Um, you know, we, we've got sustainability, we've got provenance opportunities that are coming through now. Um, and the thing is, because the world has become more virtual, we need to trust these people in a way that's more secure and very different from the face-to-face -face interaction that we've had. So, um, I, I mean, we're seeing, you know, provenance sustainability opportunities coming through now. So I would see pretty good adoption over those, of, of those in the next um, maybe two, three years. Okay, thank you. And um, same question to you, Alex. Yeah, um, I, I yeah, I, I actually agree with Hayden's uh, predictions on that one. In terms of how long we've had from a smart legal contract perspective, we've had the UK jurisdiction task force already opine on um, the legal enforceability of smart contracts last year. We're waiting for the uh, a second statement to come out. We're expecting that sort of October, November, but we've seen already an uptick in terms of people starting to think about this. Um, and legal teams particularly uh, being very interested in this because actually it's a value generator for their parts of the business as well. The technical standards I mentioned earlier, um, BSI 33 and ISO, I think we're expecting um, certainly some of those to start coming out in November in their final forms. Um, and I think that's going to start. That's, uh, that's really one of those necessary hurdles that we sort of need to get over. It's, it removes uncertainty in the market that I think is needed to, to drive this forwards. Um, uh, and the other part of it is the infrastructure as well. Um, it, it, I think it's heavily dependent on the amount of time it takes to develop that secure infrastructure that's actually capable of running the com uh, complexity um, in, in some of these contracts. Um, what we are seeing is, you know, ours is, is rattling on, it's, it's moving through the process as, as all these things do, um, and it's quite advanced now in terms of that, um, that stage of, of developing prototypes and running out into, into the market. The other ones that I mentioned earlier are also in a similar state. There's been a few different companies that have mentioned this, Contract Express being one of the more well-known ones by Thomson Reuters. So as those solutions start to come out, I think you then have kind of knocked down, if you take that with standards and, and legal obligations other pieces as well, knocked down some of those barriers to entry that I think are currently standing in front of us. Um, that's expected in short order. So two to three years seems like a pretty reasonable time frame to get these things fully up and running. Although, again, you need to think about this sooner. In terms of COVID, uh, and has this sped things up. You know what, we saw a downturn, as you would expect, in terms of the number of conversations we were having with parties. And we've had 700 over the course of the last couple of years, just to give you some kind of an, in, an idea, um, in fact, actually over the last year, um, to give you an idea of exactly how many uh, clients or, or companies are actively looking at this kind of stuff at the moment. We have seen um, COVID kind of obviously refocused energy and efforts on um, on the more immediate technological issues, um, but actually people with perhaps additional time or perhaps thinking about the ways that they can drive efficiency in their business to make up for the lost time or effort or whatever it might be, have now started to come back out of the woodwork again. And we're starting to see those conversations uh, really explode actually. Um, so the answer is, I think it slowed it down slightly, but ultimately I think it's a catalyst for, for, for driving this stuff forwards as much as it is anything else. OK, that's great. Thanks very much, um, both of you. So um, thanks very much for joining us. I think probably the GSA will need to do an update on this, maybe in the October, November timeframe. We'll That'd certainly include it in our very symposium on November yeah. the 3rd. So, um, so um, Alex and Hayden, thank you both very much. You're both fully contactable, quite easily found on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And anybody that wants a copy of Hayden's book, take him up on his offer, get in touch with him and, um, and, and share your address. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, thank Alex. Thank Thanks, Hayden. Bye-bye. All right. Cheers. Thank Thanks. You. Thank, thank you. you.